Hi, and thanks for joining me. Today we're going to take a look back at some of my favorite episodes that aired during the past year. Let's start with a story we followed last summer, the Stevens family's journey to have quadruplets. I first interviewed Sarah and Tony Stevens after receiving the news they were expecting four babies. But the happy occasion was marred by unneeded fear and sadness. Sarah's first doctor advised her to abort all four babies or selectively abort down to one or two, knowing they could never intentionally take the lives of their children. Sarah switched doctors and started her journey of carrying quads. But it wasn't an easy pregnancy. We pick up the story when Sarah went into labor. Not long after our initial interview, Sarah Stevens went into premature labor. Luckily, the doctors were able to stop it. But this resulted in Sarah spending the rest of the summer in the hospital. There were many frightening moments, but Sarah's determined strength and the loving care of doctors and nurses helped her make it through the difficult pregnancy. She really had a hard time carrying these babies. I don't want to make light of it. Um, it, was, it was hard to watch. <laughs> the babies were born on Wednesday, August 25th. Tell me what that day was like. I was scared because I'd never, I've never had a C-section before. The babies were early. I, you know, it was just kind of, it was really quick because they were going to deliver me on Friday. So I was kind of preparing myself for Friday. I was not prepared for Wednesday. <laughs> so it was, everything was real quick and hurried. And um, so I was scared, but I was also ready. You know, they were so tiny and I just, I, it was such a miracle. And I kept thinking, how are these <laughs> going to survive, you know? But um, it was, it wasn't a, it wasn't a wonderful, Wonderful day, wonderful thing to watch. Sarah safely delivered all four babies, but they were still very premature. Landon and Jackson were the healthiest, but Isabella and Samantha had a tough road ahead of them. They came close to losing little Samantha, but thanks to many prayers and excellent care, she pulled through. All of the quads were able to come home within a month following their birth, with Samantha still on oxygen. Sarah and Tony were greatly relieved to have their children home and are enjoying a rather hectic lifestyle of diapers and feedings. Well, tell me about each one of the babies and their personalities. Well, Landon's really laid back. He never cries unless there's something wrong, like he's hungry or um, he's really sweet and likes to cuddle. And Jackson's um, very strong-willed and he wants his own way and he's content if you're holding him. Um, Isabella is really loud and she demands things but she's also very sweet and um, Samantha is not as laid back as Landon but she is more laid back than Isabella but when she wants something she lets you know. <laughs> the doctor that initially counseled you he advised you to abort all the babies mm -hmm. and if not that then to abort down to one or two. What would you tell him now? You know, no matter the outcome, it's still, to me, the responsibility of, of me as a parent is to give my children the best opportunity at life that they have. I was given life, I want to give my children life. You know, if there's risks involved and the outcome may not be what we think, it's not in my hands. I'm not the one who gives life and I'm not the one that makes the decision to take it away. I am so thankful for all of my children. I feel like kind of like my family's complete. Um, I enjoy watching them grow. I enjoy holding them. I enjoy spending time with them. I just think um, this is a wonderful miracle that God's given us, and I'm really thankful for it. Can you imagine life at all without them? No, not now. I won't change it for anything. The Stephen Quads are now almost a year old. Samantha was finally able to get off oxygen in March and all four babies are healthy and keeping the Stevens family very busy. I saw firsthand what a lapful they can be and the Stevens wouldn't have it any other way. When we return, we'll revisit the powerful story of Zhang Main, a former Chinese citizen who was forced to have three abortions under China's brutal one-child policy. Look around you. We're surrounded by people who courageously face difficult obstacles life has thrown in their paths. 
Tune in each week to meet people who show there are positive, godly solutions to tough, critical situations. This Emmy Award-winning show tackles challenging life issues such as abortion, stem cell research, and adoption, and shows every human life is valuable and precious. Join us for inspiring stories of people facing life head on. Today we're looking back at a few of my favorite episodes from the show. China has a terrible reputation on human rights and with good reason. The past 30 years they've enforced a brutal one-child policy on their citizens. I had the opportunity to sit down with population expert Stephen Mosher to find out more about the history of the one-child policy. And I'll never forget Zhang Main's powerful account of the three abortions she was forced to undergo while living in communist China. This is their story. In 1979, Stephen was the first American social scientist to visit mainland China. While there, he witnessed the atrocities of the then new one-child policy. When the one-child policy began, I. I went to my neighbors and, 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 and asked them what was, what was happening and they said, well, women are being arrested. Our women are being arrested for the crime of being pregnant. And they were surprised by this because uh, after all it had been legal to have a second, third and fourth child up until that point and now all of a sudden the government was declaring no, uh, no third children, no fourth children under any circumstances. Most people are going to be limited to one child and if you happen to be pregnant with a second child you must have an abortion. Now, what was the purpose behind all of this? It was to uh, supposedly combat China's population problem. Zhang Main is one of few women who've been willing to publicly share her testimony of coerced abortion in China. I had the opportunity to sit down with Zhang Main to hear her powerful story of how China's one-child policy has affected her life. John, please tell me about your story about the three abortions that were forced upon you when you were in China. I was born in 1950s. I had my first child in 1978. I had three abortions in 1981, 1984, and 1988. When my son was five or six months old, I learned I would never be able to have another child. In the city, the government ruled that if you have another child, you would lose your job. At that time, China has a planned economy. Jobs are very important to everyone. So this policy became a strong control mechanism to reduce the country's birth. A woman learns she's pregnant. The first thing she would do is to go get an abortion. In the villages, many women were physically put and dragged onto the operation table. At that time, China did use anesthesia for abortion. It was a very painful experience. When a woman learned that she was pregnant, it was almost like a disaster fell on her. I was always scared of getting pregnant. I had so much grief for my abortion. Every time I see a child, I think about the children I lost. If I have not had abortion, I would have a 32-year-old, a 29-year-old, a 26-year-old, and a 22-year-old. My child would have brothers and sisters. A baby in a mother's womb is a life. No one should be able to deprive that life. I was deprived of such blessings because of China's one-child policy. Finding a woman like John Main to tell her story is a rare occurrence. Many Chinese women are afraid to share the truth for fear of their family safety, most of whom are still in China. We're grateful for Zhang Main's bravery and hope her powerful testimony will help bring awareness to the tragedy that's occurring. You can watch this and any other episode in its entirety. Just visit our website at facinglife.tv. It's where you can also purchase a DVD of every program. 
Coming up, we'll revisit the moving tribute we paid to America's soldiers and their families. Whether you're a student needing answers, a parent needing help, or a concerned citizen wanting to make a difference, Life Issues Institute has the resources you need to put your values into action. Life Issues Institute is an international educational organization committed to protecting innocent human life. Life Issues Institute knows what it takes. That's why millions throughout the world turn here for help. Life Issues Institute has authored more pro-life publications than any other entity in the world, and its materials are printed in over 30 languages. Radio broadcasts, newsletters, and a website filled to the brim with the answers you're looking for are just a click away. Go to FacingLife.tv and click on the link to Life Issues Institute to find out more about how you can change the heart of a nation. My son is an American soldier who was deployed to Iraq with a striker task force, and I have experienced immense pride for his commitment to fight for our freedoms. One of my favorite episodes of this season was about the tremendous sacrifices our country's soldiers and their families have endured. The two-part episode focused on three soldiers and the lifetime sacrifice they and their families are making. Army Sergeant Tony Pachi was the father of three beautiful children when deployed to Afghanistan in 2010. During a mission on March 4, an Afghani civilian accidentally drove into the middle of their convoy. Tony Stryker swerved and rolled, causing him to be thrown from the vehicle and instantly killed. Tony's tragic sacrifice continues to profoundly impact his family, but his mother Helene and brother Marco take great comfort in the fact Tony was proud to fight for his country. Nikki Bunting is a widow and mother who's doing her best to cope with a tragic loss. Nikki's husband, Army Captain Brian Bubba Bunting, was killed in Afghanistan by an improvised explosive device on February 24, 2009. It happened just four days after spending two weeks at home visiting his family. Four days after Bubba's death, Nikki discovered she was pregnant with their second son, Cooper. The joy of her new baby was a source of comfort and instrumental in helping her cope with her grief. I also had the distinct honor of interviewing Army Sergeant Shane Parsons and his mother, Cindy. Shane's come a remarkably long way since losing his legs and nearly his life in 2006. A roadside bomb detonated under the Humvee he was driving in Iraq. Shane also suffered a severe brain injury due to loss of blood and spent several months at Walter Reed Hospital. But with the help of his doctors and Cindy, Shane's making a miraculous recovery. One of the most moving parts of the episode was when Helene, Marco, Nikki, Shane, and Cindy spoke to the sacrifices they and their loved ones made. Here's where we pick up the story. Soldiers like Tony Pachi, Bubba Bunting, and Shane Parsons put their lives on the line to defend freedoms we hold dear, including the most basic right of all, the right to life. And though it's a lifetime sacrifice, their families agree it's important in the fight to defend our freedom. I know this is a difficult question, but do you feel the sacrifice is worth it? Well, the general who spoke at Tony's funeral, that was his very first question was, I'm sure all of you are sitting here wondering, is it worth it? And in the grand scheme of things, I have to say yes, because we're free to sit here and do this interview, because journalism is free, speech is free. Um, women can vote. Tony was in Afghanistan when the women had their first right to vote last year and he said to me mom i can't you can't have to see the look on these women's face to walk into a polling booth and be able to cast a vote after years and years of oppression so i know tony thought it was worth it um yes being free is worth it 
that's a really hard question to answer. Um, you know, if he were to answer that question, I think he'd say yes. <laughs> I have a hard time answering it. Um, I know he was proud of what he did, but I think that he would have made the sacrifice willingly um, because he loved his family and his friends and his country so much. But it's a big sacrifice. Our family has sacrificed a lot, but he has too. Let me ask you both the same question. Was it worth it? Yes. You didn't hesitate. Yeah, it was. Yeah, I, I, I was, like I said, I, I could have gave, I would have gave everything up. You know, and, and knowing it was, you know, I just, I'd do it all over again. We had a friend that we lost um, recently. He served in the Air Force, and Shane brought up um, a quote from President Kennedy that uh, just, I was so proud of him. He said, it's not what, what your country can do for you, it's, it's what, what you, you can, can do, do for, for your country. country. We've been a nation for, God, out some years. You know, we've gone through shambles of war and fighting for what we believe in. This is our land, we're not giving it up. <laughs> nobody's, nobody's taking nothing, nothing from me. Nobody's taking nothing from me or my brothers and sisters. We will keep fighting until, until the war is over. What advice can you give Americans to always be mindful, to always remember that sacrifice that Tony and others have paid? Just say a little prayer every day for those soldiers who are out there fighting for your freedom. And don't take your freedom for granted. Really, honestly, just to be grateful within your heart. Sometimes you don't even have to say anything. You know, you can say thank you, and it does mean a lot. But when I know somebody is truly grateful, that means the most to me. Well, I know I speak for all Americans when I say how deeply appreciative we are of the sacrifice you and your family have made. Thank you. And the bubble will always be in our hearts. Thank always, you. always. That's what means the most to me. I don't ever want him forgotten. He was such a great man. Thank you. This is just a snippet of a powerful two-part episode I personally hold very dear to my heart please visit our website at facinglife.tv to watch both episodes in their entirety or to order them on DVD. I guarantee it's a program you'll never forget. In a moment, we'll take a look back at the heartwarming story of two special high school students with Down syndrome and the prom night they'll never forget. Look around you. Every day, heroes abound in our country. We're surrounded by people who courageously face difficult obstacles life has thrown in their paths. Tune in each week to meet people who show there are positive, godly solutions to tough, critical situations. We'll tackle challenging life issues such as abortion, stem cell research, adoption, and abstinence, and show that every human life is valuable and precious. Join us for inspiring stories of people facing life head on. Most high schools hold an annual prom, but what happened at Loveland High School in the Cincinnati area is truly unique. Just a few months ago, I sat down with Drew Anderson and Tony Alton Crow, two Loveland students who happened to have Down syndrome. Thanks to an inclusion program, they and their fellow students shared many rewarding and memorable high school experiences. I gathered some of Drew and Tony's classmates to hear about their unique prom experience. Here's their story. Throughout their years in high school, Drew Anderson and Tony Alton Crow have had an enormous impact on their teachers and classmates. They've both been awarded by their fellow students the title of most likely to brighten your day. And on prom night, they received another accolade they'll remember forever. It all started with Drew announcing his wish to be prom king. Why did you guys try to get Drew and Tony elected as king and queen of prom? Well, Drew actually told us that he wanted to be king. <laughs> he would come and he said, I'm the king. And he just really, we're like, all right, let's make this happen. So, and actually, we didn't like tell people to vote for Tony at all. They just did. Like, people were like, they voted for Drew. And then it was just an automatic, like, we need to vote for Tony. It's like, they really, they both of them mean so much to the school that they deserved. They deserved this. So it's the night of the prom. Nobody knew who was going to get king or queen. 
What was that like when they announced the names of Drew and, and Tony? Well, we were all like, really excited because we all pretty much like thought it was going to be them and then once they called their name everyone just went ballistic was we were just like screaming nice. jumping up and down and then it was cool to see their reaction because they were just so happy and it just like made everyone else feel really good too yeah. they were so they were so happy there was a really great picture of drew and tony and tony has like her flowers she's like yay and drew is just like they were having a great time and like no one else would have reacted like that. So, like, it really meant something to them. Like, that's... I almost started crying, actually, once I saw them up there. Just how they excited so they were. Yeah. It was awesome. You, like, you honestly could not have asked for a better, like, ceremony, I guess you could say. You, you honestly could not have. It was, it was amazing. Like, that is something I don't think any of us will ever forget. And then I started looking at the, the students and the teachers and even the, the principal. And to see the tears of joy in their eyes was, I mean, it stopped your breath for a second. When she was born, I thought we were going to be facing some, you know, tough, that she was going to be facing a lot of tough, difficult times, rejection and not accepted and never in my wildest dreams would I have thought she would have been uh, 